Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. A very warm welcome to the LPI and to this Learning Live digital event hosted by GP Strategies. It's my pleasure to welcome so many L&D uh, professionals today. Um, just checking out, you can hear me, just, just check my audio. So if you can, it'd just be great to see where you're calling from. Um, so if you just like to utilize the chat function, just pop your name and where you're calling from. Always really, really great to see uh, where you're calling in from today. I'm going to be your host up until the hour where we're joined by our panel of experts. My name is Scott Shepherd, and I am the Learning and Development Manager here at the LPI. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules if I can ask you just to remain on mute throughout today's event so that our panel can give you their undivided attention. Our panel will be taking questions throughout so please do utilize the chat function and they'll answer as many questions as they can during today's event so i can see lots of people just joining into the uh into the session now so hi laura laura's calling in from somerset lovely to have you with us um Ahmed from stockholm uh lovely to have you i uh, hope you're keeping well hello chad calling from indianapolis lovely to have you uh with us here the, this afternoon or this morning in your case with the time change uh katrina's calling in from ireland hello katrina uh krista from buffalo uh new york nice to have you here too as well and Catherine, core service management in stockholm and tracy's calling in not so far from me from london so lovely to have you with us and isla's just calling in from troon in scotland so lovely to have you with us during this afternoon's event so whilst we're waiting for everybody to come into the room we will be starting on the hour and we'll be joined by our panel of experts from gp strategy today matt donovan and donna Glen daniel so in today's modern world learners are doing more with less l d must apply modern design approaches that enable learners to get the most out of these new experiences. In this collaborative session, Matt Donovan and Donna Clendaniel will share with you key learning strategies that have the ability to extend the learning experience and transform the workplace. So they'll be looking and discussing crafting learning centric journeys, levering a micro learning strategy and applying a user centric approach to learner technology. So we'll be joined by our amazing panel at two o'clock. So you have just joined us, a very warm welcome to this LPI Learning Live digital event. If I could just ask you just to pop your name, where you're calling from into the chat, it'd be always great to see where you're calling from. As are all Learning Live digital events, they are free to attend and you can find previous recordings on the website on some truly inspiring and innovative sessions from L&D professionals from around the globe. As we know, L&D budgets are often quite tight, so that's why we've made all Learning Live digital online sessions completely free to attend. So all you need to do is just pick a session from our calendar and register. It's as easy as that. We're not limiting you to a time window. So all Learning Live digital sessions are scheduled all year round, meaning that you can dip in and out whenever you wish. So never miss a session. All Learning Live events are recorded and you can head over to www.learninglive.com forward slash digital. Previous recordings from this year and last year um, are only available to LPI members only. So if you're not an LPI member, you can become an LPI member, which comes with a range of benefits, post-nominal digital badges, exclusive access to selected learning resources and research, research companions and discounts on many learning events, products and services. So if you want to become a member of the LPI, just head over to the lpi.org forward slash membership. So I'm just seeing who's just joining us into the session right now. Um, let me just have a look. Um, there's lots of people coming through. Uh, Mark, Matt's calling in from sunny Leeds. Um, glad it's nice and sunny up there with you. Nice to have you with us, Matt. Hello, everyone. Andrew here from the NHS calling in from Hastings. Hello, Andrew. I'm also basing Hastings, so just a, a stone's throw away from you. So uh, calling in from the conquest, I'm sure. Um, Andrea's calling in from Buenos Aires in Argentina. So lots of international L&D professionals calling in today. Lovely to have you with us. Giacomo from London. Nice to have you with us. John from Manchester. Fiona and Heather from Edinburgh. So really, really lovely to see all of our L&D professionals coming into today's session. And hi, Dean from West Lothian. And hi, all from a windy Burnley. And that's Jane. Hi, Jane. Nice to have you with us. And Ryan's calling in from Manchester. 
So as I said, we will be joined by our panel of experts at two o'clock. So just a few, few minutes now before we are joined by them, our guest speaker, Senior Vice President and Chief Learning and Innovation Officer, Matt Donovan, he will be joined by us, and he's a recognised name in learning, bringing more than 25 years of experience crafting learner-centric solutions and leading high-impact development teams. Not only has Matt received a large assortment of industry awards, including being named one of Training Magazine's top 10 international trainers under 40, his articles are regularly published and presented at a variety of national and international conferences. In his current role, Matt has collaboratively implemented and grown GP Strategies Innovation Kitchen, focusing on connecting the art of the possible with the business of the viable. You will often find him presenting at global industry conferences or writing articles for industry specific publications. In his former role as the global leader for digital learning strategies and solutions, Matt led a diverse global team responsible for creating an extensive portfolio of engaging learning experiences employed by Fortune Global 500 companies. Many of these courses have received industry rewards and recognition. We'll also be joined by Donna Clendaniel, Principal Innovation and Learning Consultant. As a Principal Innovation Learning Consultant for GP Strategies, Donna uses design thinking to guide clients to focus on their people first. Donna uses this skill to create impactful learning experiences using learning experience platforms, focusing on the needs and desires of the people to drive business results. Donna works to break down barriers that can impede learning and performance improvement within the organisation. These learning journeys help to lead to the development of innovative human-centric solution that improves employee and business performance. Donna uses an agile development methodology to efficiently deliver high quality products on time and within budget. Additionally, Donna is an effective content, uh, content creator, identifying and contextualizing relevant information to meet learners' needs. By combining design thinking, agile methodology and a learning experience platform, Donna creates solution experiences that can be prototyped early and revised as the landscape of the business evolves. So we're going to be joined by our amazing panel at two o'clock. So you're in for a great session um, this afternoon. So if you have just joined us, a very warm welcome to the LPI and this session hosted by GP Strategies. If you have just joined us, just pop your name, where you're calling from into the chat. Always great to know where you're calling from. Join the LPI and, a, and our panel of experts within L&D on the topics to upskill yourselves and share this within your organisation. Myself and my colleague, Michael Strawbridge, host events once or twice a week. And as I said before, all learning live digital events are always free to attend. So we'll be starting at two o'clock, session duration, 45 minutes today. And again, if I can just ask you to remain on mute throughout the event and don't forget to post your questions during today's session. Can see some more people just joining us. Um, Alison from Northamptonshire, lovely to have you with us with us today. Um, Will calling in from Kentucky in the USA. David from Reading, lovely to have you with us. Um, Elisabetta from Florence in Italy. So lots of international LD professionals calling in. And Justine from Wolverhampton, nice to have you with us. And Monique from Maryland in the United States. Um, as we're just waiting for a few more people just to come in before we start, Kathy's just joined us from We Connect in Chicago. Lovely to have you with us. Natasha from Coventry and Laurie from Lansing. So really, really great to see all of our L&D professionals calling in today. So every quarter, the LPI release the top five challenges that L&D are facing so that you can keep up to date with the latest trends and data at your fingertips. You can also connect with the LPI on LinkedIn um, hashtag learning live digital. Our aim here at the LPI is to give you, our LD community, the skills and latest knowledge from industry experts on current subjects that are key to personal development and organizational capabilities. I know that you're going to have a great session today with, with our expert panel. Uh, I do make it now um, coming up to two o'clock UK time. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Matt Donovan and Donna Clen Daniel. Welcome to uh, welcome to the session. Thank you so much for having us. All right, Matt, you want to get our deck queued up? Thank you, everybody. It's such a great global presence. Seeing just I'm amazed at the at the global attendance that we have here today. I am located in Maryland.
Can you see the screen? I can. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Just want to make sure there. And uh, for us here, I it, thanks for the fantastic introduction. Appreciate it. Just want to add a little bit more to that great intro that was sharing there. And I think it's important for what we're going to be talking about today. I also like to talk about myself as a human-centric design enthusiast. And this is a big part of what we're going to be talking today with, with these key three areas. And it's really shifting a mindset of how we design for today's environment to really focus on the end user, the end learner, the experience, starting the journey from that point. Um, I'm also a recovering instructional designer. I'm classically trained uh, like Donna, but uh, I am actually moving more into this broader learning journey with that new mindset. So I'll talk a little bit more as, uh, about my journey as a recovering instructional designer throughout. So Donna, you want to add a little bit more on yours? Absolutely. Uh, like Matt, human-centric design thinking enthusiast. I am an active instructional designer, so I lead a design team. Um, adore design thinking, so I can't wait to share my passion with you. I'm also an avid baker. I like to deconstruct things, build things, play with fondant, make a mess in my kitchen. Um, it is very similar to my desk, so I am excited right. to be with all of you. Let's go ahead and jump on in and talk about why are we here today? Why is this even so important to be talking about? And all of us are very painfully aware of where the past couple of years have, have pushed us. And as not only you know designers for employees, but employees ourselves, it's changing the way we think about that the work, the work environment, and, and the workers themselves and what they're expecting out of, out of our uh, organizations and when, where, and how they're going to meet their needs. And so this really comes in at that learner-centric standpoint to start to address with them where their needs are now to really enable them to be productive in the end. So that's really what we're starting about. Three topics we're going to cover, learner-centric design, kicking that off. Micro learning strategies, we'll hit a little bit around why and how you integrate that, and then around learning technology, how to integrate that, how to think through that. So all right, why do we start off with learner-centric design in a very interesting situation here? Um, this is a, a little graphic. Somebody have seen this before. I love this cartoon. It talks about how and why we need design thinking and our approaches today. So if you think about to solve a problem, and in the case of this is we need to go out and we want to build a swing. That's what uh, the employees, the learners want. Um, and basically, we have we started off with all the stakeholders, what their envision of it is, the client, the PM, the designer, the business consultant with this really grand uh, design for what it is. We come together, we work collaboratively, and we build something that's in the middle, which isn't really effective for them, when what they really needed was the end state, which was that very simple example of a tire screen would have worked just perfectly for them. So why this is, is that it says, why don't we start with what they really want and need in the beginning, still taking input from the stakeholders, but really driving into that design to get to that, what they really need sooner, faster, quicker with that. So, all right, Donna, you want to kick us off with this activity? Absolutely. I see that several of you are currently sitting at your desk. Maybe you're sitting at a kitchen table, having a spot of tea. I'm gonna ask you to look around your area. Maybe grab a scrap piece of paper, pen, pencil, marker. Maybe you have kids and there's crayons nearby. Whatever writing implement you choose. What I'd like you to do is to write your first name on a piece of paper. Just take a few seconds and write your name on a piece of paper or a napkin or <laughs> whatever you may have handy. I'm going to ask everybody to respond in chat. How did that feel when you're writing your name? Easy. Yeah, relax, fine, simple, very natural, right? Now I'm going to ask you to switch hands. I want you to go to your non-dominant hand, and I would like you to write your first name. Chad, I like that jumbled. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to write with our non-dominant and then tell me how that felt. Oh, horrific. <laughs> Impossible. Nice. Um, much more challenging. Overcomplicated. Can be. I like out of the comfort zone. 
fun and messy? Well, that's what I want you to start getting comfortable with, the uncomfortable. When we start thinking about design thinking, the focus is on the learner and the problem. Um, Karen, I love it. You're great. You're, you're, uh, the word is escaping me right now, but ambidextrous. That's what I was looking for. So for some of you, this was an easy challenge. For some of you, it really made you stop, pause, and think about how we have to start doing things differently. We need to start doing that for our learners. We need to keep them at the focus of everything that we do. Design thinking allows you to do that. So Matt, if you can go to the next one, thank you so much. As Matt mentioned, right, we have to start being more agile. The workplace has changed for our learners. Not everybody's in the office now, right? They're learning to be more agile, more flexible in their new work environments, whether they're fully remote, fully in the office, dealing with a hybrid or dispersed team. With design thinking, it gives you the, empower, the power to reimagine learning. Whether you're looking at training or business processes or acumen, this is a methodology that is grounded in a human-centered approach because we want to uncover the problems and deliver a solution that speaks to your learner. The nice part of design thinking that I really like is that it's easy, it's applicable, it's flexible, it's nonlinear, right? We can jump into any of these phases. It's iterative. And again, it draws that focus to our end user. So some of you may be used to Addy, right? There's nothing wrong with Addy. Addy is still used within the industry. But what's fundamentally different between these two methodologies? Addy is very linear. So let me give you an example. In Addy, we're going to agree at the beginning, we've done our analysis, we decide a car is the best solution. And we're gonna go through the steps, we're gonna go through the design, the development to build that car. We may test it a little bit, but here's your alpha, review it a little bit, here's your beta, we're gonna review that too, and all right, here's your gold version, and here's your car. With design thinking, it is an agile process, and now we're focused on solving a problem moving people from point A to point B. And maybe the solution turns out not to be a car. Maybe a skateboard will suffice. There's a greater focus on the who, the why, and how before we really start looking into content and solutions. So let's look at a little closer at this first phase. And for today, I know that there are five steps within design thinking, but I really want to hone in on the empathize and design phase. So empathy, we hear that word a lot and we know it's, it's a capacity to understand, to feel what another person is experiencing or you know from their point of view. Empathy is at the heart. It's the foundation of design thinking. It is an active process through every stage and it doesn't just stop with stage one. We are empathizing throughout the entire process. It's constant existence, always reframing our thought patterns back to our purpose and back to our customer. Using empathy, we uncover the voice of the learner and we begin to remove our own bias. And bias is really important to highlight. It can be so subtle and the subconscious can really impact our ability to put the customer first. So you'll notice there's a couple of facilitation tips here when we think about empathizing. Really ensure you address positive and negative behaviors and learner personas, right? What's going well, what's not going well? What areas do we need to improve? What do we need to do a little bit less of? With empathy, with the empathize phase, you'll be conducting empathy interviews to help create personas. Now, we don't wanna boil the ocean and try to get every type of persona that exists within the organization, but more of a sample size, looking at a smaller group. Maybe it's a new employee, an existing employee, a new leader, a seasoned leader. During these design thinking sessions, we'll refer to them as workshops. We wanna keep an eye on time, not go too deep. 
we don't want to create a persona based on someone in the room, right? We're not going to say, hey, this is Tom. We don't want to use Tom in that situation. These are all fictional. Don't let stereotypes take over. Also, don't use your marketing personas. Create something that is unique and tailored to your audience. Hey, Donna, it's Matt. I just want to jump in real quick. And Absolutely, I Matt. Here. What I think it is, is, and this goes back to being a recovering and instructional designer, and I love you do this in the workshops a lot really well, um, is that for a traditional designer, we often start with content first. So let me tell you, what do you want them to, to learn at the end of this? And it's not a wrong thing to do. If you know exactly what you need to build, you need, know exactly what you do, you can kind of start at that point, and that's a good place. Um, but in this one, we are purposely starting very first at who are we designing for really getting into that deep part. I love that getting to know them to know in really kind of getting those representations out of that. I really like how you guys set up using a range of those personas with it. I just want to call it out that as a traditional designer, sometimes that gut reaction is start with content, but we want to back ourselves up and go, what do we really know about them? And this is different than a traditional learner needs analysis that we've done. It's going deeper into the emotions and some of that. So. I just want to share that. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And yes, user personas, they're fictitious, right? I know as a classically trained designer, Matt, to your point, we always started with content first. Even when I think about when I went to school, it was the content first, drive the objectives. There was no talk of the learner. But user personas, once you start creating them, they help you imagine the various needs and desires of the learner. They're inspired and built on real members of your audience. You don't need tons of these personas, just a few to capture the essence of the audience. They'll be your North Star as you start developing and designing for that human-centric experience. From our personas, seeing what they see, they feel, they think, and they do, we begin to move into our design phase and look at the problem from a multitude of angles. So before I dig into define, and, and Matt, you're fine right where you're at right now, things that we've captured in personas that I've always found really interesting, right? That comes out from the audience, right? I'm a single mom. I have two kids. I don't have time for learning, right? These are feelings and emotions that really start to come out and really start to help drive how we eventually get to that solution. And we don't lose sight of that right? Or I am a new employee at the organization. I feel like I'm navigating a maze. I'm overwhelmed with what I'm doing. Those feelings, those thoughts, what they're doing all have an impact on what you're creating. So when we move into the divine, define phase, we want to make sure we're broad enough for creative freedom. That means when we start creating problem statements, they shouldn't focus too narrowly on just the specific method regarding the solution. So it shouldn't be a list of technical requirements as this would be very restricting. We wanna make sure it's human-centered, right? Getting back to those personas, getting back to that learner. And I say back, and I really mean keeping them at the front, right? Keeping them at our central focus. We're gonna to have to reframe these problem statements according to our specific users, their needs that we've driven out, the insights that we all gain during that empathize phase. The problem statement should be about the people your team is trying to help, rather than focusing on what technology do we have to use? What's the ROI or what's the product specifications, right? How is your learner going to consume it? How are they able to consume it? What can they do? We also wanna make sure it's narrow enough to make it manageable. Problem statements such as improve the human condition, it's, just, it's too broad. And it's likely to cause team members to feel a little bit daunted, right? That's a little intimidating to say, improve the human condition. We wanna make sure in this defined phase, when we talk about problem statements and how might we statements, they have sufficient constraints to make the problem manageable. So with this, some of these I've covered, right? Be authentic when you create the problem statements. Always tie them back to your personas. So you've heard me mention problem statements a few times. And before we get into that, I want to cover sample guiding principles, right? With sample guiding principles, 
we want to establish relevancy. And Matt's going to talk about the three layers of relevancy in a little bit. So, you know, some of these samples might be, you know, as a group, we want to make sure that our relevancy, we make it real. We link it to our company transformation. We focus on value. We also want to provide an opportunity for our learners to create a connection. Is there a platform for participants to co connect, right? We're familiar. There's LXPs. There's social collaboration boards. We want to humanize the experience. Do we need to have an opportunity for learners to come together and connect? Sharing stories, right? Storytelling can be a wonderful and impactful tool. Respecting time. We know that learner time is valuable and we have to focus on those must-haves. A webinar, thank you. Generating pool. So we want to pull our participants through, right? Don't forget that with them. What's in it for them? You've, that ties back to our relevancy, right? If they're not finding value in this, they're probably not going to engage with it. Making it easy, right? We don't want this to be a cumbersome effort on their part to have to engage with the learning. Finally, we want to look at enabling data. How do the learners interact with the experience to achieve that relevance, right? How are they digesting? When are they digesting it? How are they applying it? Looking at that measurement for performance impact. This information will help to inform that next design iteration. So Matt, I'll have you go forward unless you had anything else to add there. No, I think just what, what is important to understand is that those are guide, those are examples of what we have. Mm -hmm. and what I like in your workshops is when you work with folks, you custom create those. So this is how that experience should be. Think of these as, as measuring sticks. You help them create. So when you get to the prototyping and testing, did our solution meet those criteria? And it's a perfect way. And those are customized for every experience. They're authentic to the learners. I love that. That's just a great example of uh, some we've kind of pulled together from a, a handful of others. But again, it's a unique journey for everybody to build those out. So I know you also use the five W's. We do. So when we talk about problem statements, Right, we were had the personas, right? That's our learner. We have a couple samples uh, working with a client right now and we have personas for a new employee, an existing employee and our leaders. So we give them names, we personalize them, right? Maybe they enjoy to surf on the weekends and they have three kids and a dog and they're very active, right? We wanna make them as real as possible. That way, when we get to these problem statements, we can start adding that level of emotion that is level of realism. In this case, we're looking at who does the problem affect? What's the issue? When does the issue occur? Where is it occurring, right? Um, and then why is it important that we fix the problem? So if I look below, there's an example of what a problem statement might look like. So a PIMA is somebody that you will see kind of through here. We're going to look at these. A Pima feels overwhelmed. So our who is a Pima, right? She's at the center. What is she feeling? She's feeling overwhelmed. When? Daily, right? Maybe it's frustration. Because there's too many conflicting priorities at work. That solves your questions of the what and where. Which leads to, <clears throat> which leads to negative emotions about her work and the work environment. So that covers like, why is it important, right? What's the impact of her feeling this way? Why is it so important that we fix it? So we start looking at what was in our persona and what problems are coming out of it. And we start looking at each of these five W's to create problem statements. Matt, any additional color you'd like to add nope. there? I'm good with that. All right. So from that, we start taking those problem statements and we convert them to something that we call how might we statements. And you may wonder, like, why are we creating how might we statements? Well, they help to drive our design. It help us, helps us to reframe our problems so that they're meaningful and actionable. And you'll notice it doesn't say, how might I? How might our team? How might a Pima do something? No, it's how might we? How suggests, you know what? We don't have the answer yet, and that's okay. 
We also know that we have a variety of ways to solve for this. And we're gonna look at that in that ideation phase. Might allows us to explore solutions. It's not necessarily the solution, but it always allows room for innovation. And we, that alludes to, this is gonna be a collaborative effort. This is something we're not gonna focus on in a silo. So these are just some samples, right? Joseph, I love that you're more inclusive of others. Absolutely. So when we look at the persona and we look at design thinking, I know we've only focused on the first two phases for today, but it, it's a full circle approach, right? That persona is at the center. And by having that persona, we're able to focus on the problems. Notice we have not gotten anywhere close to solutioning yet. And we're figuring out those problems we're now saying, how might we solve for those? So it's a full circle approach back to a PIMA. Matt, anything else you would like to add there? No, I think it's really good. I just think that it builds that logic that what I love about this, it builds a logic that gives you the big, why are we doing, why are we designing what we're about to design for whom? Sets you up for success when you go into that solutioning phase. Absolutely. Which brings me to the MVP, right? Not the most valuable player, but the minimum valuable product. We wanna provide the learners just enough features to be able to provide feedback to us. And you've probably heard of MVP, whether it's an agile methodology, something heavily used by IT. And if you start with something like a skateboard, where we were talking in the beginning where it's a car, this is a functional prototype because it still allows you to get from point A to point B. If I wanna go from Maryland to Indiana, could I do it on a skateboard? Absolutely. It would be a really long trip, but I could do it. However, as the learner starts providing feedback on the skateboard, they might say, you know what? I got really tired on my, my drive from Maryland to Indiana and I would really like to have handlebars to rest on. So we start these iterations and start moving through and then maybe it becomes a bicycle because they would really like to sit down during the ride or maybe then it's a motorcycle. And eventually we might get to a car or we could stop at the motorbike. At the end of the day, you want your MVP to have just enough features and functionality to allow the learner to provide feedback on the idea and to make sure you and your team are on the right track. <coughs> So during that process, you want to ask questions of your learner. Did it help you? Is there anything we're missing? What did you like? What did you not like? Gathering that feedback. These questions will allow you to evaluate the prototype and improve its next iteration. It helps everybody agree on the solution and be more inclusive. You know, I, I love it when it comes into this. And this is just going back to that learner centricity of what you're doing. You start off with the who and the what are we solving for? And we're really understanding them. We've, we've built some in the middle. Now we're going to do concrete examples that get tested. This is where it comes back to those sample criteria, those guidelines. Did the prototype we put out meet the baseline criteria? Do we learn things as we put it out there to get feedback? Adjust the criteria, adjust the prototype. And I love this one element out of the Agile Manifesto. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend taking a look at it. Uh, one of my phrases in there is, is, it's the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. So the idea is that if we don't need anything, if, if a bicycle fully meets it, as Don was saying, stop there, don't do any more. I love that. Give them exactly what they need. And then over time, they, their needs may grow. That's fine. You can revisit the prototype and pull it forward. But do as much as you can. And in today's world, I would say as complicated and, and overwhelming as it is with all the information, the simpler we can make it to meet their needs, the better off we are. But this is, this is quite a journey to kind of really set that learner centricity. Um, so no, Don, I appreciate that. And I know you're going to jump in and share some uh, insights as we go into the next section. I want to talk about the micro strategy and push us forward on that. So micro learning, uh, very simple micro learning is a lot of what it sounds like. And, and really just to set that aside, it, it is a, a shorter expression of a learning concept, topic, element, feature. It is meant to be smaller and fit for purpose around that. So um, knowing that that's kind of what it is, I wanted to talk a little bit about why it is so important to have that into the broader content strategy. And it really comes back into this concept of 
relevance. And, and this is really one of the things that we want to be able to allow the learners and themselves to be able to find the things that they need to do, have the right content when they need it, how they need it. And a micro learning approach really enables that strategy. I love this picture here. It's a woman very, being very reflective. She's out in the middle of the sea. And the idea is that she's probably going to get thirsty. Here she's surrounded by all this water, but it's not drinkable. Like our learners, they have way more content and information than they can probably ever use or consume in the lifetime of their experience. The problem is, is, is it relevant? Is it helpful for what they need to do? And if we look at that, relevance is the drinkability of that content and the sea of content that we have. How do we either help build it so it's more relevant? And that's where that learner's interest is coming, knowing what you're trying to help them solve. It's also making it so that they can find it when they need it. And those micro strategies allow you to build smaller pieces to be able to be reused as you go over time. So when you look at this, it, it, as we start to look at the ecosystem of how we start to bring in what we're building and what we're putting in place, there are three elements left to right here. Um, if you're not familiar with the five moments of need, learning need with uh, uh, Conrad uh, uh, Godfrey and Bob Mosher, I, I recommend you take a look at it. It's a very learner-centric model, really talks about a lot of uh, performance uh, in the flow of work. I love it. But it really talks about different points of when learners need to learn something. And the premise is that I will need it in a different format. So if I'm learning something for the first time, I need additional scaffolding, I need additional information, it's going to be a little thicker around it, that context wrapped around the core content. But if I'm trying to figure out a solution to a problem, something's gone wrong or something's changed, I don't need to go back to the history, the evolution of the topic. I need a very pointed and specific um, you know, support component around it. So my, as my learning needs shift from top to bottom, I may have related to the content or topic, but I need different layers of context, uh, different layers of utilization, how I'm going to apply it. And that goes back in your design. Micro learning enables you to be able to put smaller pieces or smaller manifestations to be spread across the actual moments of learning need. And then you can either wrap that context or pull that context away or go deeper if you need to on a topic. So it really enables that. Now, I've added two additional moments of, of learning need that I've seen. These are not part of, of the, the five moments, but I do think that innovation and growing for the next role are important. What's different about those is the first five are really around what I would call convergent learning. These are about being able to bring everybody up to a base level of performance or, or coming together to perform something. Innovation and growing for the next role are often intrinsic drivers that are what I would call divergent. It means that I don't need the same thing I had yesterday. I need something very different than what I had. So how do we actually make micro learning available and findable when the same old, same old is not going to really work? I want to do something different. I want to innovate. Can I pull it together from another area? So in your micro learning strategy, you do need to think about how those components will be used. Where do they fit to meet a certain moment of need? How they'll either enable a convergent need or a divergent need as we've shared here. Now, the second column here really talks about the first most important rule of a modern learning experience is that the learners must take accountability for the learning journey. So that means that they no longer in the passive role of simply being a consumer of instruction. They are now becoming active agents in the system. And what we're saying is that this brings in elements of social learning and other components. So now more than just saying, I push content, you consume. Now they are participating as moderators, curators, contributors, creators, collaborators. They are taking on very dynamic roles in it. And they are actually generating and creating what? Micro learning. So the idea is you want to be able to put in the system. So as designers and enables, enablers of the learning ecosystem, not only do you want to be able to put out micro learning components, you also want to have components out there that enable users to quickly come in and add content and context to be able to share with each other. When you think about moments three, four, and five, when I'm applying and refining, when I'm changing or reacting to failure, a lot of your expertise in the field, your peers, this is where a lot of that content's going to come from as it starts from, I had this succeed to this is a really good practice to becoming a formalized thing that we're going to teach everybody. But, but a lot of that comes in that learning, social learning strategy. So you want to be able to use micro learning and enable them to kind of create small bits of wisdom to be shared and be found as you start to really look at moments three, four, and five. 
So the two big takeaways on this slide is really thinking in our micro learning strategy, how do I build micro pieces that fit across the five moments? How And then how do I start to create space for my learners to actually come in and join in this experience? One very quick example, um, I'm sure everybody's heard probably of TEDx. It's a great way where you have these very topical presentations, very dynamic speakers. They come in and they talk on a topic. The thing that's very related to that that I want to call out is something called TED Ed, which, which I love. And the premise in this, it, it is a very simple user generated tool where you can actually start to create and publish your own course based off a of TEDx video. <clears throat> So it's a five-step process, and you can basically create your own little what I call mini course in five simple steps. You can pump it out in 20 minutes or less. You pick a video that you want to talk about, a topic, and then you first question is, so why is this important? What do you want others to know? Then I can add second question is, what's a little extra you want to? Ask them a question is the third. Do you want to create a question, a discussion, a poll? get some feedback, generate some of that social learning feedback around it. And then the last one is, is I want you to extend or expand. Where will you go and think more about this? And then you hit the publish button. What is beautiful is that although you have this rich bank of TEDx videos, there are literally over a half a million courses. I believe over half a million at this point, if not more of courses that have been generated by individuals out there. So it's about being making it easy for folks to contribute to the micro learning. So again, that was TEDx tied to TED Ed. I love it out there. It's a simple example. You can go out and actually sign up and create your own course as well. Um, Matt, I'm gonna jump in. Yeah, go Matt, ahead. I was Don. gonna say, as you were looking at the expanded roles, um, Elsa asked, how do you help learners move from a passive consumer role to a more expanded active role? So really bringing them in, getting them to engage. Yeah, that's that draw in that engagement. That is it. And I think that's the thing is you and I talk a lot about recovering instructional design. It's not about me just creating end to end courses, you know, 30 slides in a, in a, in a web based training or, or a, a next based course. It's about how do I draw an experience that pulls the learner into the journey, they take accountability to become part of it, your engagement point is right on top. I'm glad you added that because I was blown right past that. Um, you know, I talk a lot about relevance and, and I think if, if, if I have to talk about, it, I think relevance is the coin of the realm because that's what is most important. That's what's going to drive that engagement we were just talking about. And, and it's about creating that ecosystem of assets that allow us to come in and really start to achieve that. But from micro learning strategy, it's important to kind of think about how do I start to talk about relevance and layers? So a lot of us have probably taken a business acumen course. And if you have, you know that financial um, financial documents, understanding financial documentation is a core part of it. So if you're in that, you may have to understand what is an income statement, a cash flow statement, a balance sheet, what are they, what are they for, how do they work? And so the three layers of like the first layer of relevance is what is an income statement? What does it look like? What does it tell you in a very general standpoint? Now, this is where you can actually get, I would not spend time rebuilding this. If I had to do a business acumen course tomorrow, I wouldn't build this. There are a ton of little micro modules on what is an income statement generally. Now, what's important in, as I get to layer two, which is what does our income statement look like? Our companies, how is it structured? What does our income statement tell you? Well, that you're probably going to find a lot less of out there in the space. So building off of maybe the curated asset that you brought in that you didn't build, but you're borrowing, you're bringing it into the overall learning journey. Now I want to be able to use some of that peers or the experts and say, here's our income statement. How do I read that? And if you've ever taken training on this, you know that the general description versus the actual implementation can be very different. <laughs> so it's important to kind of take that second cut of, of relevance and bring it closer to home. Now, the third one is, how can I use our income statement to drive business decisions? And I guarantee you, this one will not be out there in an off the shelf catalog. This is really about how your business applies, you know, taking a business acumen model, other data points in the decision and you actually make a decision with this. And this is something where you really wanna make sure you're incorporating and engaging your experts to help you kind of create this. The idea behind this is that where we historically back in the day started to kind of create one big course to cover all three of these, this is where you start to see your micro learning strategy coming in extremely helpful because I can 
correct by crafting out the layers of this, I can break down the content strategy and really come in and think about how do I source it so I don't have to build all of it. I can borrow some of it and then I can focus on generating from the field great, you know, very authentic examples. So I'm able to kind of bring that forward. The idea behind all of that is to be able to create each of these pieces and then kind of wrap around a, 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 an ecosystem around them of these micro learning components. And so here's an example. We've got our uh, Apima in here again. She's looking at this. And so your micro um, learning assets will start to pop up. Like for example, you could use QR codes to access like some just-in-time training, small bits of you know when I need it, where I need it. I can have a cohort driven space to experience where we have over time, we have some curated places and discussions, we're sharing thoughts over time, lots of reflection, lots of mindset happening in it, but it's uh, supported through these little micro learning assets. A chat bot, a really great example of being able to distribute and extend, pulse out information over time, uh, curated pathway, testimonial videos. I love that one as a way for users to be able to contribute their voices, which is also a great way for inclusion. So for example, if I'm a new employee onboarding, how do I bring in new concepts, ideas, reactions? I'm able to pull that in from the peer testimonial. So you can kind of see all of these things kind of coming in. And the question is then, how do you use, and we've got Sarah here, how do you start to use in her journey or her experience, how you might flow this over time, how you would start to bring together these micro learning assets that with Sarah or a Pima in control of the system, they are actually able to take control, find out what they need, when they need it, how they need it. They may go into pockets which are more prescriptive, but overall they are able to kind of engage in the overall learning experience. And a micro learning strategy really enables this for them to be able to get what they need, when they need it, and then move in, exit, or come back into the overall experience. So now blended learning, I think as you look at, you're blending all of these things together. What's important to understand is that as you do incorporate a micro learning strategy, you need to think about how you are bringing it together. Now, blended learning has been around for a long time. We used to have like, I would do like a face-to-face -face workshop, and then I'd follow up with some job aids. It's a lot like the salad on the left. It's really more about each individual piece could stand on its own or I could add them together. It's a great salad, but it's like that. When we talk about micro learning strategies blending into a learning experience, it's a lot more what on the right. It's more blended like a smoothie. All the pieces and parts come together to create something more than just the sum of its parts. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's the thing is that that's what we're doing today. So your micro learning strategy isn't just creating the little bits and pieces, it's how they actually come together to create a greater experience as you're going. So when I talk about blended learning, I'm more talking about blended like a smoothie is really where we're going with on that. So I had mentioned a little bit about how your, your, your strategy, your micro learning strategy now allows you to be more efficient around your areas of content. So the idea is don't have to really build how you actually uh, you know, you don't have to build everything in the system. You can actually borrow it. You can buy some of it. Uh, I love burn. We added burn uh, more recently, but the idea is get rid of anything that you absolutely don't need. Get rid of that, reduce the clutter, but really can you borrow it from somewhere else? Can, is there an off the self solution that I don't need to rebuild it? Can I, is there a solution out there that can be customized or adjusted? And the last one is, can that be it build for anything that you can't find anywhere else? The idea here is that you want to be able to leverage as much as you can from existing sources as possible. And a micro learning strategy enables you to more discreetly do this than you've been able to do in the past. So I know we're covering a lot of ground here uh, and this is meant to be topical, but uh, and I'll put a plug in here. You'll see our contact information. Well, Don and I love, we're, we're learning nerds on this stuff. We'd love to talk about it. If you ever want to follow up on these conversations, we'd be glad to talk with you more about it. What I wanted to jump in here is around thinking about how do I incorporate the technology into my overall experience. Just a real quick exercise here. I just want to throw it out. This one is, if I were going to invite you to a delightful dinner, so this is a grand, you know, coming over to my house, let's say I could invite everybody over. We're going to have, you know, a thousand people over. We're having this huge, but we're going to run a, a, a multi-course meal. But unfortunately, I don't have enough serviceware for everybody. So I'm asking everybody, what would you like? So if you had to get picked to pick four pieces, 
Let's just say you get to keep the plates. That's fine. But out of the silverware, if you needed four pieces, which ones would you pick? So just in your mental note or drop it in the chat window, just to kind of commit to an answer, which of these four would you pick? And this is, ties back into a lot around our tech questions, because when it comes into the next one, let me show you what the actual menu is now. And all of a sudden, if I was saying, hey, look, we're going to have oysters in the shell, not on the half shell, and you didn't pick the oyster knife, that might be a challenge as you're trying to bang the oyster on the edge of the table to be opening it up. The, Matt, reason the I wine glasses were leading. Um, <laughs> were they wine with, and that's but, a great, I love that because we definitely will have wine and you can put all kinds of wine in there. And actually, if you're a bourbon or a whiskey fan, they do as well. So fantastic to see that. All right. So I see spoons, wine glasses, forks, plates. So yep. a wide variety. Excellent. And I think that that's the idea from the feedback is that we start, I'm, this is a way we often get questions from our partners when they talk about technology. They come in and say, I want this tool. But my question is that let's take it back. What are you actually trying to achieve with it? And that's what's most important to start again back to the learner centric design, starting back to what is the experience you want to create? What is the outcome you're trying to drive towards it? And then making the right selection of the tool after that. A lot of times we get folks that you know, I, I heard that the tool does this and I need that tool. Digging into it to learn more about it is absolutely critical. We've got 10 questions to think about when we start bringing in tool or technology as we start to bring it in and work with it. Now, as was mentioned early on, I oversee the Innovation Kitchen and GP Strategies. Um, there are several organizations that are starting to kick up in the L&D spaces, what I would call these innovation centers, which I'd love to see. But the idea is where you can now get to proactive conversations around the tools or the technology in advance rather than a reactive response. So being able to think about different types of tools or technology now before you need to implement them is great. And these are 10 questions that are really great to kind of help guide your journey as to saying, you know, uh, you know, what is the experience that will fit? Where does it fit in what we say in the zoo? What, you know, what is it trying to drive? What kind of a classification? Is it like a learning management system? Is it a learning content management system? With, if you know those two things are different and their intent and what they're doing and a very big difference and, and they have design implications that are uh, different as well because you have to build in the tool and one of them to get the content. So all of these are really critical as we start to do. How will I gather data from the learners? How will it be shared? How will it inform the organization to make decisions about the experience on it? How will we use the data to go back and shape the experience for the learners themselves? So these are where you start to think again from a learner-centric standpoint on one side, what is the tool intended to do, the natures, the features? And on the other side, from a business as a stakeholder or a designer as a stakeholder, how easy is it to work with? And the other one is how will I get, use, protect, and share the data? So these are great 10 questions to kind of bring into as you're thinking about what we're going to kind of play into that. So, um, you know, I would jump into, I think this is a really good point to kind of stop to talk a little bit more about the questions that you have. Um, I do have an example we can pop back if we need to on that if it comes up, but I wanted to open it up to questions and, and see what we have out there. And Scott, I don't know if you've seen any good questions coming across as well. We're just waiting for some questions to come through. So um, yeah, fastest fingers first uh, to get your questions there into <laughs> in, in, into the chat area so that um, so that you we can answer them before uh, before we finish up this afternoon. Um, Heather has mentioned the TED uh, the TED the TED Ed tool mentioned. Is there a cost? You know. Um, I don't know. It's, I think it's free to individual users. If you wanted to use it in an organization, I do think they have, um, they might have costs associated that just like the TEDx videos. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Joseph said, what, um, so what is a way we can use small groups to access these great tools? 
Ah, that's great. So one of the things from, from our side is we started to create an innovation kitchen, which allowed us to kind of mount up an experience that allows users to kind of come in and experience in a safe space. One of the challenges we were running into with a lot of our clients is that just to even try something out and get it through security to even try it out was difficult. So I would recommend finding a partner that be able to kind of mount some of these or working with the vendors themselves to get a hands-on trial of it, like a little bit of a, of, a, of a case example. We often create where we'll invite partners into our space because in GP, we created a safe space that allows people to kind of come in in a very low risk, um, low concern area to kind of try out. You want to try out an adaptive learning platform and see what it's like, what it's like from a user experience, see what it's like to build in it. We kind of create these sandboxes and these places where you can come in and play a little bit to learn about it, to make more informed decisions. <clears throat> so again, kind of setting up either relationships with the, the vendor partners themselves or with, with an organization like GP and there are others out there as well that can do this to kind of help broker some of those conversations to say, you want to try it out. Here's some ways to do that. We've mounted several of these um, in, in a sandbox to say very low threshold. You want to try out a chat bot? We've got a great example of here's an example of one you could sign up and, and see what it would look like. Uh, and, and we have great partners on that. Like Acronym Annie is a great one. Uh, new employee onboarding, new employee comes in, I need to know three letter acronyms. I can have an app right on my phone while I'm in a phone call. I can look up a three letter acronym for the organization. You, we can try those out relatively low, low threshold. So great question. Thank you, Matt. Um, I think we've got, so we've got time for one, one more question before we do finish up. A great question from Fiona. Um, Fiona has asked, as things open back up, how do you keep up momentum for online offerings combining with an in-person context or experience? Wow, that is that is a good question to kind of to wrap us up. Donna, did you have an answer? I can jump in, but then if you had an answer, you're on mute. <laughs> Some of the solutions that I've worked on with clients, it's still thinking about the learner. Talk to your learners. I can't emphasize that enough. Right, you've got to find out what their needs are in this new workplace. So, as an example, um, one of the solutions that we came up with a client is a fully hybrid in person virtual event to discuss a topic on empowerment. We had 50 people in person, we had about 75 online. And the biggest feedback that we got was our virtual audience felt like that they were in the classroom. You have to have a high touch, high engagement program. If you are just asking people to go out there and just find things on their own, they're gonna do it, but you've got to pull them in. What's the organized organization's purpose? What's their goal? What's their vision? What do you wanna get them to? What do you wanna get them excited about, right? Talk to them, find out what excites them. So it's keeping that conversation going just because you've put the solution out there, it doesn't stop there. Remember, design thinking is iterative. So we can go back into it, as we said, you know, we, we could stop at the bicycle, but we still might need the motorcycle later. Yeah, Be best advice, ask them. Love that, Donna. Try something, ask them how did it go? Because the things you're talking about, rhythm, flow, equity in the experience, all of that comes in. You're only going to know by asking and trying something. So um, Scott, appreciate the opportunity. We love being here with you all today. Um, it's been a great experience from our side. As I mentioned, you know, we are definitely learning nerds in this space. And so <clears throat> jumping out, if you want to reach out and connect with us out there, please do. We'd love to hear from you. And, um, you know, if you ever just want it, we, we talk this design stuff all day. We love it. If you have any questions or thoughts, Donna and I are available with that. So again, Scott, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We appreciate everybody joining and all the great discussion as we we're going. So thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon and morning, everybody. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.